because we crave just that, the 10 degrees and nothing more, we are basically robbing ourselves of the opportunity to getting the 25 degrees. We settle for too little. We settle for too little. That's why the Buddha talks about 10 degrees, they're still suffering. It's just the absence of, of colder, of a colder temperature, is the absence of a worse situation, which is why we experience it as happiness. But, and we, what we also do, we misperceive the external objects that may trigger that emotion as the actual cause for that. Am I making sense? Hummus! <laughs> right? Oh, hummus is the real... I'm exaggerating, but having a relationship, having money, having three cars instead of two, having a bigger house than my neighbor, you know, all this. But those are not actually giving us happiness. They may, they may stop temporarily a worse state, and then we mistake it for real happiness. If that was really be able to give us happiness, then every time we have one more car, we would be happier. But happiness is actually, the kind of happiness that we experience is just the stoppage of something worse. So when you're really, really sick, and then the first day you feel better, whoa, you're so happy, even if it rains all day long. So the rain has got nothing to do with our state of happiness or whatever. It's just the absence of a worse problem. And that that's really shows us that that's the greatest we can experience. But we are robbing ourselves of something greater, which is why the Buddha says, it's all suffering. This is all suffering. Don't settle for this little. Don't, don't settle for less. And so he's saying, that's why he doesn't call it happiness, because otherwise that's what we aim for. And that's, that's just a waste of time. Happiness is the 25 degrees. Happiness is the absence of attachment and anger and worry and discontent. All that is possible and we have little glimpses of them sometimes. Every now and then when we're just, there's no craving. There's like a short moment, but it, it really doesn't last. But sometimes in the presence of a Lama, for instance, they can give you a glimpse. They can give you a glimpse. It's the power of their mind. They can give you some glimpse of it of the possibility. You feel a real deep sense of happiness and, and satisfaction to give you a sense of that possibility. So when you talk about the Four Noble Truths, therefore the promise is the truth of cessation, the third truth, which is saying everything that is in the way towards being happiness that can be removed. And then you're no longer experiencing plus 10 or plus 12. Or it's those 25 degrees and it's Stable. It's at stable temperature. Right? So this is what Buddhism is talking about. By implication, by removing the suffering, that's the state we're actually craving. Lasting happiness. Lasting sense of contentment. No up and down and up and down. Just real satisfaction. It rains. It doesn't. There's hummus for dinner or not. No, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Your neighbor's obnoxious or Buddha. Couldn't care less. Someone hacks off your arm, right? Cuts off this arm into little pieces and makes minced meat from it. And the other person takes your arm and, and massages it and, 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 I don't know, points, applies the most beautiful ointments. You, you have the same attitude towards that person. Same, there's no difference. Because whatever makes us unhappy is gone. <laughs> So the same blissful state. I mean, it seems impossible right now, and we need to start where we are. But if you ex if you don't explain that, then a lot of what it talks about in Buddhism doesn't make sense. And when we talk about renunciation, the wish to be free from suffering, we're not talking about being free from worry, being free from pain. We all have renunciation, and a dog has renunciation. Then. Because that wish of being free of that obvious minus 10 degree kind, we all have. No, here we're talking about even, even wanting to get rid of what we call happiness. Because it's actually not. It's actually not. It's just the temporary absence of something worse. And we don't know better, so we call that happiness. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> 
listen. Okay. <laughs> so that's what it's all about. And basically, all you can do is start practicing. Because the beauty about practicing this, and whether you call yourself Buddhist or not, whatever, if you apply those little techniques, these techniques that are described, you actually feel happier. And then you're motivated to do a little more, and then do a little more, and to do a little more. So in the end, I can talk until I've not, nothing left to say. It doesn't help. The only way to really find out is start with the beginning and check. Does it make sense? And once you feel, oh, it works, take the next step, till the next step. And as long as it works, great. And if it doesn't, well, you do something else. Right? Okay. I hope that helps. Um, Shoshka. Yeah, it's about the karmic connections that you said the guru <coughs> to create a lot of karmic connections. Yeah. Because then you said that we don't have karmic connections with the with everyone. With the, but if we are if we are living since the beginning this time, this time mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. it mean that everybody has some karmic connections? Okay, you're right. There's some karmic connection, but not enough. <laughs> not strong enough because it's the most recent ones that are the stronger ones. So the more recent, the stronger our connections. Yes. Yes. I'm trying to understand consciousness that, that is not dependent on the brain. Uh-huh. And that is never ceasing. So the, the way I try to think about it is my consciousness when I was a bee. When you were a bee? Yeah. Like, so, so how, how consciousness, uh, yeah, basically we can talk a little bit more how Consciousness is perceived within a bee, or was it just without a brain? Do, Do bees not have brains? <laughs> well, the, yeah, just within a bee. Like how, I'm trying to understand the consciousness that is not depending on the brain, which is what you saying. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Like, I guess the nervous system is, of course, not the same as a brain. And I don't know whether bees have a brain, but... I mean, there's certainly living organisms that don't have a nervous system but don't have a brain. So brain is not absolutely necessary. Um, of course, even like a person who has near-death experience when the brain is no longer working, there's a brain, but there's no brain that is in any way effective. So you can, even while you're still a human being, when your brain stops working for a while, it doesn't mean your mind stops working. But then you can also take birth in a in a form of in the body of a being that doesn't even have a brain so how is that possible well the thing is this comes a little later we have coarser minds and we have subtler minds a very subtle mind at the time when you have a near-death experience or when you're dying doesn't need a brain but then when you're reborn you you can't remain in that subtle state a buddha can that's what you're aiming for to gain control of the subtle state, that's the main aim of Tantra really, to utilize the subtle state such that it remains. And then that becomes the mind that is now ever present. We can experience this and it's very blissful. It's, it's said to be very blissful when it arises, but we won't be able to hold on to it. We'll then need to move on. So within this very subtle mind, there's no anger, there's no attachment. However, we cannot hold on to it and we are born in a coarser state. And that coarser state, if it's the a bee's mind, because there is no brain, we won't be able to do the same thing that we can do as a human. So the great advantage is to have a human brain because although in both cases the mind is coarser, but because the coarse mind depends on a brain, in the case of rebirth, uh, not in the formless realm, but in a form realm, it depends on a brain to be able to do the things we can do as humans. It's good to have a human brain. So what can I say? Um, <laughs> what more can I say? I guess that's... I'm just trying to understand what is consciousness, basically. Ah, that's a different question. You know, I, I know brain is like mental function as part of the brain. Okay. What is consciousness that is not... Well, the brain is just the physical happening, okay? And we're very used to thinking of brain and mind as the same. 
That's just a habit we have. So my recommendation would be learn more about the mind. So we've already done a lot of it, but that's of course not enough. So to learn, get a better sense of what the mind is. So the best way is really to study this and to, 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 to um, apply this to your own life. Right? I mean, right now you're experiencing heat or cold, right? Now we think it's the body that experiences that. But that experience of like, oh, it's uncomfortable or it's too hot or too cold, the body doesn't experience that. I mean, the body has certain chemical reactions, it, it goes through chemical reactions, but it, it's not like. It's not the body experiencing it as such, we just say it is. It's the mind that experiences that. Comfortable, not comfortable, pleasant, unpleasant. So that experience of that is the mind. And the way to get to know it better is to observe it. To observe it, it's mindfulness of your own mind. That's the, the way to do it. And it just takes time. So my recommendation is therefore, learn more about this, study more about it, read more of it. And once you have some kind of a clear sense of what we're talking about in the mind, well, try to recognize it within yourself. And at some point, I think maybe maybe anger is a good way of, like anger is a very strong emotion that is very difficult to ignore. Uh, it doesn't arise that often, so we're not that used to it as long as it's not always present. And just watch this, like what does it do? How does it arise? What is its object? And in that way, you just get to a better understanding of, of what anger is. So the brain is just neurons firing away and, I don't know, enzymes and whatever. But they're not the anger. They're not the anger itself. They're not that experience of like, oh, I want to hit that person. The thought, I want to do this, I want to do that. That's not the brain. It's just assisting that process. It's assisting, it's firing away the, the right kind of way. But it's the mind doing it. What else can I say? So really, like, unless you experience it, it's very difficult to, to, to really say much about it. So you yourself need to make an effort, and it doesn't take that long. It's not that difficult. Um, I would suggest to read as much as you can, to hear teachings about this, and of course to apply it to yourself. But before long you realize, ah, that's what we talk about. Okay? Yes? Yes? Make me think. Maybe a weird, a weird question, maybe. But if the mind doesn't need a brain, mm -hmm. then why there isn't mind in trees or in rocks? In the How do you know there isn't? Mm -hmm. From Buddhist perspective, it's I mean, as in, like, is a stone a sentient being? Mm -hmm. Um. Well doesn't act like a sentient being. I mean, actually, like, strictly speaking, in the scriptures it says that trees and plants are not sentient beings. But it's debated. It's debated. Who knows? Can a tree become enlightened? I mean, not in the form of a tree, but, you know, be reborn. I mean, His Holiness is once uh, has been asked that question, and that was his answer. He says, I don't know. In the end, we don't know. So, I mean, and, and another question is, for instance, artificial intelligence. Right? Yeah. So, artificial intelligence, I don't know. Is it possible that you can actually artificially create a brain? Uh, artificially create a brain where that, that computer acts exactly like a living being? This I don't know whether that's possible. Um, but when I talk about artificial intelligence, I mean more like, can you build a robot? Someone is reborn in it. <laughs> Right? That can serve as the base for someone. I mean, so far it's unheard of, but it doesn't mean it's impossible, right? We could maybe someone create such a brain, like such a mechanical brain, that someone is actually reborn in that robot. That would be a seventh realm. So six realms, you have the robot realm. I'm just theorizing. I'm just saying. It doesn't need to, to, to build the brain because we said mind doesn't need a brain. So. No, no, but I'm saying taking that, taking modern ideas, I don't think it's necessary. <laughs> 
But I'm also wondering, is it impossible, right? Could it maybe not be? But the main point is, someone must have the karma to be reborn in such a state, <laughs> right? I mean, if no one has the karma to be reborn as a human, you won't have humans. So there are always two aspects. There are always two aspects of everything. If, for instance, there is a plane accident, right? You can't have a plane accident without someone having the karma to experience that. But if you have the karma to experience a plane accident, you also have to have a plane accident, right? In order to be beaten up by someone, you must have had, you must have created the causes to be beaten up. But, and also for that karma to ripen, you need someone to beat you up. You need both. Which is why we have the karma to be beaten up. Definitely. There's no karma that we haven't created. There's, I mean, in terms of negative karma, we've basically done everything. We've existed since beginning this time. But those circumstances, those external circumstances, they also have to be there, such that they fit exactly in a way in which that karma can ripen. Am I making sense? So you always need two aspects. Just karma alone is also not enough. So you need karma and certain circumstances that are not strictly karmic. Not everything is karma. A lot of people think that, but that's not true. Not every cause, is, cause and condition is a karmic cause. Not every result is a karmic result. That's, that's where karma becomes very difficult. Now, therefore, if someone has the karma to exist like a rock, well then that's what they will be. They'll be in this rock existence. Right? So it just depends on what causes and conditions we have created. Basically, our experiences are the result of actions we've accumulated in the past. And if we've done something, don't worry about the options in which they can result. They result in all different types of ways. And in this world, for instance, we talk about the six realms, in this universe, if you like. But the Buddha said there are endless universes, there are endless galaxies, endless possibilities. And when the Buddha talked about these different realms, it seems to be limited what is happening here. Sometimes I have this thought, you know, like, there's so many galaxies, so many solar systems, and when the Buddha talks about life in different galaxies, and we talk about humans, they may be very different to us. Maybe they have three noses. Maybe they have six legs. In a sense, like, it's like if someone has created the causes for that, like I said, our existences are the result of different actions. So there's no limit to the actions we accumulate. There's no limit, therefore, to how we can exist. And so, therefore, it's a possibility. That's what I'm trying to say, as a result of our karmic actions. So if it's a stone or a tree, I don't know. I don't know. I know what the Buddha said exists and what we can see all around us, but if that's I don't think that's all. I think there's more to it. Actually, can I add to it? Yes. Uh, they always say that Buddha can manifest in a village or whatever needs. Mm -hmm. So David has a consciousness. Okay, there's this really difficult explanation of the Buddha manifesting in the form of a bridge or like inanimate objects. Well, if it's a bridge then it doesn't need to have a consciousness. If the Buddha manifests, and I've just recently talked with Gishtub and Besangla about this, and he was very clear, he said, when the Buddha manifests, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Buddha is that bridge, just manifesting that. And it goes a little bit beyond, it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's beyond our ability to perceive that. I mean, um, so, but in answer to your question, basically, all right, so the Buddha can actually manifest certain things, but it doesn't mean the Buddha, that that's a Buddha, actually. Okay? Right, maybe that's enough for those who are new. Uh, yes? Who is reborn? Who is reborn? What is reborn? The, the subtle mind. The subtle mind. So if I'm a rock, where is the mind? In the rock. <laughs> what is it do? 
just be a rock. <laughs> I mean, what do you do as human? Be human, right? I mean, mind is not solid. It's not physical. No, but your body is, and your mind is not, and they still exist together. Well, forget about the rock thing. <laughs> the thing is, like, I'm just saying. Like, the thing is, like, because it was in connection to that, but of course, um, it's not. This is not conventional kind of the way it's explained. I'm just kind of theorizing about it, like saying, is it totally impossible that someone is reborn as a, but of course that's usually not how it's described. And I don't know, in the end, I don't know. So, but leaving aside the rock, right? I mean, if you're reborn as an ant, right? Or reborn as a person who's lock-in syndrome, okay? So lock-in syndrome, have you heard of that? Yes. Oh, what is Mazi? What is it in Hebrew? I think, Stock I think Stockholm. You talk about that one? No, no, not the Stockholm. No, Stockholm is not. Lock-in syndrome. Lock-in syndrome is like a disease where your body stops functioning. Your body stops functioning, as in like you. I don't know. I just heard there's a there's a there's a book about this about this French guy who was locked in his body and people didn't know he was alive. They were all, they almost uh, switched off his um, life support and in the end they realized he could just move his, his eye. That was all he could move. So he, was, he was locked in. Something about the diving bell or something. But that was in the diving bell. So there's a movie on that and there's a book on it. And in the end they were able to communicate with him through his, his eye movement. So right, left was yes, and up, down was no. So that's how they were able to communicate. And fortunately, they didn't switch off his life support because they thought he was gone, right? Because there was no reaction. So that's described as lock-in syndrome. You're locked into your body. There's, there's nothing, you can't breathe on your own. Of course, you can't eat. You're kept alive by a machine. Yeah. Oh, we never can eat one. You have in Israel, yeah. So that person, if you experience that, well, what is the mind doing? It's going, bummer. <laughs> How did I get into this? I mean, you still think, you still think you have emotions. I mean, according to this description of this person, they said they were just thinking in words vividly. They could do everything else, could think in the same way, but they had no control of their body. They were basically locked into their body without being able to control it. So it's like, how's that possible? The body is physical, the mind is mental. How can you have no influence on the body? Well, it's possible because of the karmic connection, you're in that body. You have a karmic connection. The moment you're born, at the moment of conception, you and your body are linked, and you stay within the compound of this body. This is where the mind is located. Although it's non-physical, it is based on a subtle energy. So the mind, Actually, the mind and the very subtle energy that the mind comes along with, they cannot be separated. So because of that subtle energy, it can be located in a physical place. And due to the karma, the karmic connection we have, our, the karma that is responsible for where we are right now, those two stay together. Until the karma, there's like every, every karma that is responsible for us being born in a certain state comes with an expiry date in the sense that there's a limit to how long it's around. And when that is over, it, the, the mind will leave the body. But for as long as it is with the body, unless we commit suicide, unless we kill ourselves, um, there's nothing we can do. And in this situation where you're like locked in, like, there's nothing your mind can do. Right? It, it can't even keep you alive. Because you need life support to be alive. And other people may not even be aware that you're around. And this person who had this experience, they knew everything that was going on around them. They knew what the nurses were saying, the doctors were saying, and they just thought they, was, they were already gone. And when they discovered this movement, they realized, oh my God, the person is... And then they could actually communicate with them, and eventually this person was cured because they could talk about that experience. Yeah. Uh, I just want to take someone who hasn't said anything. Yes, yes, yeah. Free will. Okay. If uh, the current um, state of my mind is dependent on the past, mm -hmm. like uh, this 
moment, on previous moment, on previous moment, on previous moment. Yeah. So it means that something began, like a stack of cards, something moved, and the last one moved. Mm -hmm. So where is the free will if everything is determined by previous, 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 previous moments? As I said, there is no absolute free will. What is the not absolute free will? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There is relative if I free will. Move, uh, one card, you know, if I do the lotto, mm -hmm. then the last one will fall. Okay. So there's control. relative in relation to, for instance, you and I. Yes. We are the result of previous causes and conditions. And not just the cards that we, not just the cards that we put up ourselves and started to move, but also external circumstances. It's an extricate net of causes and conditions that give rise to us making a decision at some point in time. All right. So free will, free will means basically deciding independently of anything else making a decision not possible not possible because nothing exists independently so if nothing exists independently you cannot have an independent decision making so if you define free will that way very simple nothing exists independently so an independent decision doesn't make sense all right now having decided that but can we talk about a relative free will? What does it mean, relative? What is the that I think I have free will? No, 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 no. That's a wrong. That's a wrong. Prisoner. No. Is this long or short? Depends. Right? In relation to this, it is short. If you didn't have this, it couldn't be short, right? It's in relation to something other than itself that we can say it's short. If you didn't have anything in relation to which you could say it wouldn't be short. Am I making sense? And that is true for everything. That is true for everything. That in relation to something other than itself, we can say it is this, that, or the other. Now, how is that true with free will? In comparison, in relation to, let's say, I'm chained to this chair, I said that before, mm -hmm. I have no choice to leave this room. You, on the other hand, are not chained. So, you actually have a choice. Or to give another example, if you were born in Israel, versus you are born in a brothel in Bombay, Okay. You're born in a brothel in Bombay. Who has more choices? Same. I think I have a choice to leave, but it's not true because my decision is based on yes. previous previous moment. So my decision is based on it is predetermined, let's say. Okay. I just think that I have this choice to leave. But it's based on this that I saw something and that But you're again going into an independent choice. You're talking about an independent choice, right? You're saying, but well, we have already agreed there is no independent choice, okay? So there's no independent choice. This we don't need to discuss. Is there a dependent choice? Is there such that independence on certain causes and conditions? You could become a doctor, so you basically have created the causes and conditions to be a doctor, but you've also created the causes and conditions to be a teacher. Those causes and conditions are present. For the child in the, in the brothel, for instance, there's no option. There's no option. But, or for like me being chained here, there's just no way. I mean, the, whether I want to leave or I don't want to leave, in the case of you, if you develop the wish to get up and leave, you can. And if you don't, you, you won't. Right? So. You could, if you had the wish to leave, you could leave. If you have the wish to become a doctor, you could become a doctor. If you have the wish to become a teacher, you can become a teacher. Someone who's in a brothel, they have the wish to become a teacher. They have, let's just take that scenario. I don't know whether it's the example. Of course, there are some people who can free themselves. But in general, 
If you're born in a place where your parents are going to determine